Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 7, and Jesus speaking to his disciples says, Keep on what? Asking. And you will receive what you ask for. Keep on what? Seeking. And you will find. Keep on what? Asking. And the door will be open to you. And the next verse, for everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be open. You parents, if your children ask you for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Somebody say, how, how much, much more? more? I love that. I love the emph emphatic there. How much more will your, what kind of father? What kind of father? Heavenly father. What? Give good gifts to those that earn them. To those that deserve them. To those that what? Ask him. Ask him. Father, thank you that you're that good. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Well, happy Father's Day today. Those of you watching online campus and all over the world, we're so glad that you're watching. And I'm glad that about 100 years ago that Father's Day was actually started in the state of Washington. And, and this lady just decided, you know, we want to do a day in the state that honors fathers and and not honor fathers because they're perfect, but honor fathers because they are fathers. And it's spread across America. Now it's a tradition that we do that uh, every June on Father's Day. And uh, we've honored a lot of fathers here. And, and like I said, we don't honor fathers because they're perfect, because there's no perfect fathers. But I want to talk to you today about the one perfect father. Come on, his name is God the Father. Before I get to that, I just thought about some things that fathers say to their kids, the top 10. When I was your age, and then they start telling them stuff. No, we are not there yet. How many of you guys have had that one? That's Beniah. Two wrongs, BJ, don't make a right. This is for Bella. Do I look like I'm made of money? Her response is, yes, Dad. You are. That's what mom says. <laughs> this is for my little one, Beniah. This will hurt me more than it will hurt you. Then he said, spank yourself. <laughs> Number six, I heard this when I was a kid. Don't make me stop this car. Mm. Number seven, a little dirt never hurt anyone. You know the five-second rule. In my house, it's five-minute rule. Just pick it up, eat it. And my, my kids, you know what they do when they don't like something? They'll drop it on the floor on purpose. It doesn't work in my house anymore. You'll eat it. A little dirt never hurt anyone. Oh, I said that one. Number, uh, oh, here's another one. Eight, and this was for Benaiah this morning. Don't worry, it's only blood. He said he needed a band-aid. No, you don't. No, you don't. Write a passage as you get a scab on there. It's just awesome. Number nine, this is what I tell my kids. I said, do I have to repeat myself? I said, did I stutter? <laughs> Number 10, this is a good one. Don't ask me. Ask your mother. <laughs> you see, a lot of us have heard those phrases either from our dads or we heard those phrases coming out of our mouth. You know, I'm not a perfect dad by no means, and I have flaws. And, you know, there are times when I just say, man, I, I, God, I, I need to become a better father. And we all need to become better fathers, no matter how old you are, how old your kids are. You know, Pastor Paul has been married 40-some years. He has uh, six kids. I don't know how many grandkids. And you know what's so interesting is that being a father never ends. I mean, you think that when they get out of the house, they're gone. No, they're not. They're just older and keep coming back. And it's like, man, I'm saving for my retirement. But my, my financial planner said to me, he says, you know, you got kids. Yeah. I said, I said, they're out of the house at 18. He says, nope, they're never out of the house until you die. So you got to have some money saved up for them. And so I begin to think about this. And I could have talked to you today about, you know, dads, you, you got to love more, listen more. You got to do this more. And all the dads walk out here beat up and say, man, I'm a crappy dad. Well, let's settle the fact that all of us are crappy fathers. And let's just talk about the great father in heaven. Amen. Now, now I, I know there's some great fathers here. And, and all of us are great fathers in one aspect. But there's only one perfect father. Come on, he's the heavenly father. 
It's important for us to really understand our Heavenly Father because the way you perceive God the Father really determines how you ask Him, how much faith you have, all that. Because if you view God the Father as a harsh, distant, per, you know, performance-oriented God uh, the Father, you won't come to Him and ask Him freely like a little child. If you think God is stern and God is looking for you to misstep, then He's going to get you. Then you're going to be afraid. But my Bible says that perfect love, come on, cast out all fear. God is not giving you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. You see, the reason why it's important for us to get a great understanding of God the Father, because if this relationship is healthy, these relationships will be healthier. Amen. Amen. You see, because some people say, well, I had a bad childhood. My parents divorced, or, or my dad did this, or my dad did this to us, or did that to me. And if you're not careful, you relate to God the Father like your earthly father. But God the Father is not a better earthly father. God the Father is the perfect heavenly father. He's perfect in all ways. Jesus, now we find in Matthew chapter 7, it's the Sermon on the Mount. You can read the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is talking possibly to 15,000 people, but he's really focusing in on his disciples. And he begins to talk to them about different aspects of life. And right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus begins to relate to them about the Heavenly Father. You know, see, when Jesus comes on the scene, Jesus' main role was to now display how the Heavenly Father really was. Jesus said this way, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus said, I don't do anything unless the Father instructs me to do it. So when you look at the life of Jesus, you're actually seeing God the Father. Jesus now takes a moment and he begins to talk to his disciples about the Heavenly Father. Notice in chapter 7, verses 7 through 11, we're going to go back to verse 7. Jesus uses comparison and contrast. In Jesus' day, Jewish rabbis would use a technique of teaching, which was you would compare and contrast the lesser to the greater. You would start with the lesser and compare and contrast to the greater. So Jesus now is using this principle or this technique of a rabbi in teaching his disciples in the crowd. And he says to them, let me talk to you about the lesser. He says, the lesser is your parents and my parents. He says, if them being evil. Now, why is he saying that? He's not saying they're evil parents who beat you or, 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 or somehow ignored you. He is saying in comparison to the perfect father, we are sinful. And he says, if they being sinful, give good gifts. Watch me. The lesser giving good gifts, which is lesser, right? How much more? Now, there's lesser. Now, he jumps to the greater. How much more? And he points out to the perfect heavenly father, the greater, who will give you even greater gifts if you would just ask him. Why don't we ask God for good gifts? The number one reason why I believe we don't ask God for good gifts is because we disqualify ourselves. Because we say, well, I can ask him for that. I say, why? Oh, I haven't been that good. Okay, so stop with that thinking. So when have you been that good to receive anything from a perfect God? Could it be that God gives you things not based on how good you are? but based on how good he is. Jesus actually begins to give us a glimpse into the Heavenly Father. And number one, you need to write this down. He tells us that our Heavenly Father is good. That the Heavenly Father that we serve, the Heavenly Father that watches over us, he's a good God. I remember Oral Roberts used to say this all the time. You know, God is good and the devil is bad. That's simple theology, my friends, but sometimes people get it mixed up. Oh, that God causes bad things. Oh, it's God causing that. No, God is good and the devil is bad. In fact, the Bible declares in Psalm 25, 8, look what the Bible declares as we begin to look at the goodness of God. It says that the Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. 
I love it that the Lord is good and does what is right. Say that with me. The Lord is and does what is right. See, the Lord is good. Look at Psalm 34, 8. I love this one because this begins to tell us to do something. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Something begins to happen when you taste, when you experience that God is actually good. We must settle in our hearts today, church, that we serve a perfect heavenly father that is good. God is good. God has good things for you. And why do bad things happen? Oh, bad things may happen. Oh, storms may come. But in the middle of all that, you got to stand up and still declare our God is good. Even when there's bad things that happen, the Bible declares that God's going to cause everything, the hurtful things, the painful things, the tragedies, the, un -under the, uh, the things that we don't understand. He's going to cause all those things to work together. Come on, for your good. Joseph, when he was pulled out of the prison and pulled out of the pit, when his brothers sold him off into slavery and all the bad things happened, eventually he came out of the pit and eventually now he's second in command and his brothers who sold him out years before who are afraid because they think he's going to take revenge, he looks at him and says, no, you don't understand what you meant for evil. God has turned around for good. I'm going to prophesy something to somebody right now. There have been people that have been planning bad against you, have been scheming against you, has been talking about you, has been trying to bring you down. But I prophesy in the name of Jesus that everything people have been doing against you, God's going to turn around for good. God's going to turn it around. God's going to promote you. God's going to elevate you. God is going to put his favor and his honor on you. No weapon formed against you is going to prosper, but God that is good is going to bring you up and out in Jesus' name. Come on, you got to say amen. Come on, 830, clap your hands like you got some energy. I know what it's like. I know what it's like when people talk about you and say things about you and, oh, my goodness, and, 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 and I got to be honest, I got I to gotta guard my heart. As a pastor, I got to guard my heart because I want to go ninja on people. No, seriously, I, wanna, I, wanna, I don't want to take out a cross. I want to take out a throwing star. <laughs> And I got to keep telling myself, even when people are bad and negative and talk, talk about us and talk about this and talk about that person, and I shake my head and say, why is that people make judgments on situations they don't have the full information on? How silly that is. I withhold my judgment until I hear the full story. It's amazing that I run into people and they say, oh, you're the pastor that I like. What? Where'd you hear that from? Oh, you heard it from the internet. Oh, you heard it from just grown a person that left the church, but they don't know the full story. It's getting real quiet in this church here. <laughs> just look straight ahead. I'm not looking at anybody in particular. It's, it's amazing. But you know what? As long as I believe that God is good, it doesn't matter if people are bad. It doesn't matter. If people have put you down for whatever reason, God is still good, and God does not discriminate his goodness. He is so good, his goodness will change your badness into goodness. He will love you into living right. Oh, God, I felt that one. He'll love you into living right. No, it's not. He's going to get me. No, let me be honest with you. You should have been dead already. If that's the way God was, come on. God is so good. Pastor, how can you believe God is good in the midst of the tragedy that happened in the midst of a family, you know, that, that uh, attended this church many years ago, and uh, we opened up the church, and they were able to do their, their, their memorial yesterday. How can you declare God is good when they lost their, their daughter that was so young? How can you declare that God is so good when the officers get, get killed just, just eating lunch? How can you declare that God is good? Because in the midst of an evil, terrible world, we need to declare all the more that in the midst of pain, 
in the midst of stuff we don't understand. Somebody's got to get up and say, there's still a good God. You still could turn to him. He can comfort you in all your pain, and he is still there for you. Come on, clap your hands, 830, because I'm preaching that God is good. Number two. Jesus not only declares that the Heavenly Father is good, but he has the audacity to say that a Heavenly Father is a giver. Jesus said he's a big giver. He says, watch me. He says, how much more? How much more? Indicating, comparison and contrast, indicating that your earthly fathers did good things, but how much more? Comparison, contrast, Jewish rabbi, the lesser to the greater, that I'm ready to declare to you that God wants to do infinitely more. He wants to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask, think, or even imagine, according to the power that works within you. Ephesians 3.20. Our Heavenly Father is a giver. Amen. You don't have to manipulate them to give to you. You have to manipulate me to give to you. Hello. Unashamedly, I say that. You can manipulate me. No, you're manipulating me. It's okay because if you're going to give me something good, I will be manipulated. But you don't have to manipulate God the Father. Because His goodness is not based on what you have done. It's based on what He has done. And because He's that good, He's a giver. You say, no, no, that's not true. You've got to be good. You've got to earn it. You've got to deserve it. You as an earthly father or earthly mother being evil, you still give good gifts to your kids on their birthday when they don't deserve it. I know you do. Unless you're evil. I mean, how bad? I mean, you're, I can tell you my kids, they're not angels. They're just regular kids. And there are times it's like, oh. And I've said this before, why so close to your birthday? <laughs> okay, you haven't been there, have you? Sometimes it's, why on your birthday? I'm telling Wendy, no, Wendy, no, we're not going to give him that extra gift. We're not going to give him the extra gift. He doesn't know about it. We're not going to give him the extra gift. And the birthday comes out, and the cake is out. Candle the happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. And all of a sudden, my heart starts turning. Happy birthday to you. Where are you going? I'm going to, I'm going to come back in just a minute. And I go, I'm going to grab it. And I, uh, here you go. And it's like, and <laughs> simply because he was born. Yeah. That's it. So why does God give you things? Simply because you were born again. That, that's a good place. Simply because you were born again. God is a giver, and all good gifts come down from him. James chapter 1, verse 17, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, and he declares to us whatever is good and perfect comes down to us from God our Father. Now stop. This is a way for you to filter in life what is from God and what's not. So whatever is good and perfect comes down from him. Watch me, because he is a God, the Father, who has created all the lights in heaven. He never changes or casts this shifting shadow. Pastor, why does tragedy happen? Because we live in a fallen world. Why does tragedy happen? Because I have a devil who's going around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But no matter what happens, God is still a giver. Well, what about people who are going through stuff right now? He's a giver of comfort. What about those right now that are sick? He's a giver of healing. What about those that are financially in trouble? Come on, he's a giver of resources. God is a giver. And you need to declare that and believe that, that he is that good. Then, Pastor, why am I not giving, getting good gifts? Because Jesus tells us what we have to do. All you have to do is ask. Pastor, get a little bit deeper. Okay, I looked up the word ask in the Greek. And it meant ask. I mean, sometimes we read this and we try and make it more complicated. Okay, what? No, just ask. You know, the older I get, the more I just ask people. Hey, can you do this? Before I was young, well, what happens if they say no? Uh, what happens if I don't care about offending people. Can you do this? And they'll say to me, no, I can't do that. I say, oh, that's great. It's no problem. Thank you. Next week, I'll ask them again. <laughs> hey, can you babysit for us? How much do you pay? Well, I don't need you anymore. Hey, can you, can you babysit for us? Oh, pastor, would love to do it for you. Thank you so much. Uh, how much do I have to? Oh, no, pastor. It's just a ministry of mine. Good. I'm asking you next week, too. 
You see, the reason why we don't ask is because many times you don't ask because you're not sure about the character of the other person. You're not sure what they're going to say. If God is good, and if God is a giver, and he's only going to give you what is perfect and right. So if you ask God and he says no, that means it wasn't perfect and right for you. Let me help some of the people that are not married. I know you asked for Jessica Elba, guys. But somebody said amen to that. <laughs> Reason why I don't get it, because she's not perfect and right for you. So, so when God says no, it's because it's not perfect and right for you. It may be perfect and right for somebody else, but it's not perfect and right for you. And if I trust that he's that good, then I'm going to settle in my heart that, okay, God, I'm going to keep on asking, and you're going to give me what's perfect and right for me. Yeah. Wow. So, for instance, my, my kid just had a birthday. Another kid is coming up. I mean, imagine little Benaya. He's going to be 7 September. Bell is turning uh, 10 July the 8th. Uh, BJ turned um, 14 on June 11th. And Bell is July the 8th. And, uh, and then uh, 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 my wife is August 8th. And then my son is September 8th. Crazy, huh? When Benai comes to me and he says, hey, Dad, I want an AK-47 for my birthday. <laughs> How many know it's not perfect and right for him to give that, right? It's like, hey, hey, Dad, you know, flip me the keys to the Mini Cooper. I want to go driving now. I'm seven. <laughs> I got special blocks made so I can actually do the car. How many know that it's not perfect and right for him to get that right now? But when he turns 16 and 17, that's perfect and right for him then. Not the AK-47, the Mini Cooper. <laughs> Somebody say, God gives good gifts to those that ask him. Number three, write this down. The Heavenly Father is gracious. He's gracious. Aren't you glad that God is gracious to us? Romans 8.15, a great scripture. And it says, Paul is saying, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you receive God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him, look at the phrase, Abba, Father. You know that, that Abba means daddy, daddy. That's Bellaboo, daddy. You could actually call God, come on, somebody, daddy. The reason why is because he's that gracious. The Bible declares that you have been adopted, that God adopted you, brought you into the family because you're not that good because he's that good. He's that gracious. And when you trust Jesus as your Savior and your Lord and you declare him to be now king of your life and now you begin to follow him, you are now adopted into the family of God and you're accepted by the Father because of God's great grace. Religion tries to create grace. Many people try and do religious things so that God can be gracious. I'm going to do enough so I appease him so now he's gracious. That's not grace. That's religion. That's works. Listen, you don't have to get God to be gracious. He already is gracious. When you understand he's full of grace, he's full of mercy, and the Father extends his grace to us. And now because he put that bridge of grace out to us, we get to walk over that bridge of grace into a right relationship with him because of the Son. And I could declare today that God is gracious. God is a giver. God is good. And this is the character, come on, of a perfect heavenly Father. Amen. Lastly, as I close, number four, the heavenly Father of course, if he's a good father, he's a giving father, he's a gracious father, he still gives guidelines. In Romans chapter 12, verses 5 through 11, the Bible says that if God does not discipline you, you're not really his child. You know, when, when, when the Bible says that God disciplines those that he loves, that word discipline comes from an original word that indicates training towards maturity, not punishment because of a sinful act i got to settle this. 
I, I, I studied this word out. I, I, I looked at, and I'm not going to exaggerate, I probably looked at about 21 different commentaries and prayed over this. Because I hear people use this scripture, you better watch out because God is going to punish you. God's going to get you. God's going to hurt you. That is not in the Bible. When you become a son or daughter of God, he is, he is training you. He is training you towards maturity. Just like a good father trains his kids towards maturity. I'm not punishing them for an act. I'm training them so that they are mature. Maturity has nothing to do with age. There are people, there are men and women that are in their 40s and 50s, and they're still immature. Age does not make you mature. It's how you respond to life that makes you mature. God, through all the things that we go through, he disciplines us. He trains us up primarily through his word. And as you read the word of God, all of a sudden now you say, oh, man, that's not how I should respond. Holy Spirit, thank you right now for revealing to me in the word that I should not respond that way. Thank you for giving me the grace to respond the right way. And if you don't listen to the word, God will bring other people, leaders, pastors that bring correction. And those that spur correction and don't want to hear correction, the Bible actually calls them fools. Only a fool despises correction. I want to be told by my elders if I'm going the wrong way. And repentance says, I change my thinking, and when I change my thinking, my behavior begins to change. See, I could change your behavior, but if your thinking never changes, you keep going back. I could shock you. Don't do it again. Don't do it again. Don't do it again. Don't do it, Don't do it again. But when the Holy Ghost takes the word of God and begins to transform your thinking. See, when I was a youth pastor, I had a 1,000 young people in my youth ministries. I had a 1,000 young people in six years. I only had two girls get pregnant out of wedlock. So my critics say, oh, man, you must have told them about safe sex and wear this and wear that. No, no, no. In fact, very rarely did I deal with the issue of purity because my kind of thinking was if I could show Jesus and get them to fall in love with Jesus and show them how much Jesus loves them, it will take care of itself. It's, it's, it's amazing what happened. And we proved that out over six years from 1992 to 1998. The numbers are there, not inflated. Not somebody said, no, in the seats, behinds in the seats, over a 1,000 young people on Wednesday and Thursday night. And I saw that happen. And I look back at my youth ministries, pondering over that the last few weeks as some young people have come back into my life via Facebook and all the things that they're doing. And they keep telling me, thank you, Pastor, for talk, talking to us about Jesus. Thank you for talking us and preaching about Jesus and getting us to see how much Jesus loves us and cares for us. And I'm here to tell you, my friend, when you begin to understand that God will give guidelines to you and you don't correct and you don't rebuke correction, but you take it. You take it. My role for my staff, pastors, and my staff isn't just to be a cheerleader, although I want to be, but I want to correct them because I want them to mature. Come on, Pastor Mitch. I mean, you have grown kids. You want them to excel. There's nothing worse than seeing people making mistakes that you try to correct when they were 15. Staff members that I'm like, come on, guys, you're still doing that? I told you about that. And it gets me frustrated because people talk to me. I'm like, hey, I know. And you say, well, I don't see it. I'm going to end with this. The reason why you don't see things and I don't see things is because you have a blind spot. You should thank God for your wife. <laughs> and you should thank God for your husband. I thank God for this woman sitting here right now. Because I would not be the man that I am today if I would not listen. And, and when she tells me things and I get really upset, it's an indication that she's right. And you know when I talk to you as a pastor, and I talk to you, and I tell you something, you get mad at me, you think you're offending me, I just, in my back of my mind, I said, ooh, I'm right. Ooh, I'm right. I'm right. Ooh. And you talk about me on, on Facebook and Instagram and, and post things and, and, and do this and do that. I just like, ooh, I was right. I was right. 
And I don't, I don't take it like, ha, ha, I was right. But as a father now in the faith, it hurts me because as a father, you can see the shipwreck of your kids coming before they see it. No, you can. I've been in ministry for 27 years. I've seen the greatest people that none of you would understand their names, know their names, but Pastor Mitch would. The greatest guy that led the prayer movement in America with the dog tags. His last name was Lee. Shipwreck. What you don't know is I, I know friends of his, and we tried to help the guy, and he says, uh-uh, you're wrong. I've seen guys shipwreck, Robert Solaridan. I've seen guys shipwreck because the number one reason why guys shipwreck is because they spurn correction. I don't care how gifted they are. I don't care how good they could sing and preach and wow the crowd and have an anointing. That means nothing if you don't come under correction. Amen. Nothing. And I, I, I feel that that's strong because if you find yourself being corrected by an employer, take it. Don't fight it. Take it. If you find yourself being corrected by your mom and your dad, take it. Don't, what happens if they're wrong? What happens if they're right? Ooh, it's getting quiet in this Pentecostal church. <laughs> maybe, just maybe, God the Father gives you the spiritual father, the spiritual mother you really need, not what you really want. You do not decide what family you get born into. And you do not decide when God places you under authority. Why did he place me under an authority? That is unfair to teach you something. So that when you have authority, you won't be unfair. It's not to uncover, but it's to learn. That's a good place to clap right there. I will never uncover my parents. But let me just say this. How many of you have parents and there were some things they didn't do quite well? Can I see your hands? And, you're not, and we're, not, we're not dishonoring our parents because we're not saying it. But you know what you do now? And I do this right now. Thank you, Jesus, for great parents. But I learned not just what to do, but I also learned what not to do. It's not uncovering them. I called my dad, loved my dad, 71 years old, still golfs, still probably could take me in arm wrestling. You saw my arms on the picture. I know he can. But I'll never, how disgraceful it would be for me to uncover my dad. It's a tragedy. So today, we have a perfect father. Walk out here rejoicing in how good he is. And if you don't have a so perfect earthly father, just for a moment, just for a day, look at all the good things and thank God for him. Can I hear amen?